Hello Ghanaians, welcome aboard. <laughs> Plague on words. Well, we continue with the AM show as we have an interaction on matters of national concern with a former vice chancellor of uh, the University of Ghana and a statesman as well, Professor Ivan Adayman. So he shares his thoughts on Ghana at 65, UTAG's conditions of service, education generally in our country, the economy, the e-levy and more. Stay with us. Yeah. Is it any better than, let's say, a year, a year and a half, two years ago that we spoke? Is, is free SHS delivering the goods, so to speak? I don't think so. Frankly, I Why don't not? think so. You know, I've had my own ideas about free SHS since 2012. And I made my ideas known to the current president. At that time, since basically when he started talking about yes, the fact when he that started talking about should it. he be given the nod, he, yes, would, he would do this. Yes, right? and I, I took the opportunity to go and have a chat with him. He put me in touch with his uh, committee that was working on the, mm. on the policy. I had a lot of discussions with them. Unfortunately, my ideas were, were, were said to be n incompatible with the president's objectives. Mm. I have no quarrel with that. Unfortunately, 2012, he didn't succeed. He came in in 2016. And then, with a few modifications here and there, mm. started implementing it. But I still had the view that the way it was being implemented was going to create a lot of problems, challenges, not only for education itself, but even in the general economy of the country. I felt that the way it was being implemented it was unsustainable. And at that time, you know, I came under a lot of flack. But it's interesting that some of those people who thought what I was saying was too far-fetched are now the same people who are singing the song that I was singing, or I have been singing which, since 2012. Which was what? That let those who can afford mm. pay. And whatever they contribute will go a long way in helping those who really, genuinely need help. Mm. I don't see why, if, if I were in a position to send children to school, or grandchildren to school. Right. I don't see any reason why government should pay for the food that my grandchild or my child should eat in a boarding school. Mm. I don't see any reason why that should be the case. So it's a futile initiative. It's, it's a future. Uh, to me, it's a, it, it's, it's a drain on the economy. Mm. Secondly, it, several studies in various places have shown that where those who can pay, pay. Enough revenue is always generated to benefit those who genuinely need support and help. If what they pay is put in a sort of um, uh, basket right. so and invested, a fund, a fund, yeah, and invested to give a, a sort of scholarship or bursary scheme to those who genuinely need to have it. The finance minister had a similar idea at the beginning of this program. I don't know where, whether he still holds on to the same idea, but maybe he's now been beaten to uh, conform with the president's uh, mm. own ideas. But he had similar ideas to what I had. Mm. And I'm happy to know that now people are beginning to think in the Along same direction. So, so you're talking about proper targeting. I've heard yes. people say, for example, recently on some of our shows uh, on, on Joy News that, look, I, I can take care of my children. Why are you paying their fees? Why are you paying for all of these other things? It should rather be other people who cannot foot these bills, just like you're saying, that should have to you know, benefit from the program. In terms of a review proper, uh, some inkling, some idea has been given to that. And, and some of the very people you are suggesting back then said, no, 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 no review, are now saying, let's review it. We are pumping about 7.5 billion CDs every year into this enterprise. Some say it is a drain on the coffers of government because we're already in dire straits in terms of our economy. 
Uh, do you feel vindicated now that we've got to the point where we are considering a review of free SHS? Certainly, I feel vindicated. Not necessarily because it is, uh, uh, as a result of it, we are now getting problems with our economy. But I think that it, was, it would have been the wisest thing to do right from the beginning. Because it was obvious right from the beginning that we could not have afforded what we, 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 we instituted. It was not possible to put all that money, you know, we, were, we said we were going to depend on oil revenue. And as I have said, that was not the objective of the utilization of oil revenue from the beginning. We said we were going to invest some money, in the oil, uh, some money from the oil revenue into education, but that was not in the way we were doing it. We wanted to use the oil revenue to equip schools mm. so that they will be up to speed Right. With modern trends, schools really need facilities. Primary schools, junior secondary schools, or junior high schools, the tertiary level, they need equipment, they need facilities, they need consumables. That's where the money should have gone to, mm -hmm. not on consumption in the way it is being done. Mm -hmm. That has been my beef all this while. And there are others. You've spoken about your, your influence, your work when it comes to uh, uh, the PIAC, for example, the Public Interest and Accountability yes. Committee. A former chair of PIAC, uh, Dr. For, Steve Mantea, yeah, yeah. Has, has indicated that uh, we should set up an investment fund yeah. uh, to, see to, to cater for uh, free SHS. What do you think about that? Is, is that one of the solutions? Yes, it matches with what I, I just said. Mm. What we had envisaged the investment of oil revenue into education for. You set up a fund, and that fund can be accessed for specific things, including the award of scholarships at the level of senior, senior high school at the level of university and even at the level of the primary and junior high school uh, system. Mm. And it would also, it could also be accessed for uh, the supply of facilities, equipment and consumables to all the schools. Go to some of the senior high schools. Laboratories don't exist. Mm. You find a lot of the schools are not able to run the so-called STEM or STEAM uh, projects that we, uh, we are beginning to envisage. We, we are doing all that by word of mouth without necessarily providing the necessary facilities that will make sure that, in fact, the policy is working. Mm. And we, we are in the university. We, re, we are the end re, uh, receivers of the end product from the senior high school level. And when they come, they know next to nothing, be not because they are stupid, but because they have not had the opportunity to come face to face with the practicalities of what they ought to have learned at the uh, senior high school level. The and even at the, have been Yes, and even at the, at the junior high school level. Junior high school level, they are supposed to do some handsome practical work, even in the sciences. It's not happening. It's happening in very few schools. That is even reflecting in the, in the sort of people that are getting into uh, the high-profile high courses like medicine and engineering. Mm. You find that it's only a few schools which are very well equipped. And the well-equipped schools, it's not because of what government is, is sending to them. Mostly it's from the, of the, it's from the, school, uh, the schools, uh, old students and right. PTAs. Mm. They are the people supporting the schools. If you take my own former school, uh, Achimota School, after the colonial people built the, the science laboratories, all the science laboratories that have sprung up in Achimota School have been built by private sources. When I was a student, we had Shell, Shell Ghana, right. building a physics and a chemistry laboratory for the school. Mm. No laboratory was built until recently when um, GNPC mm. also built a modern uh, state-of-the-art laboratory for the school. They haven't seen any laboratory 
from government. So you can imagine what is happening in the schools don't, that don't have the clout to access some of these private initiatives. You, right. can, you can imagine what is happening there. Right. And, and, and since you've started off that conversation, but before we get into the bit about, because it's 60 years of med medical education in Ghana, but, mm -hmm. and, and since you started off there, we, we just might segue into that. But before I go there, what would be your assessment? Again, I, I'd like to do this mm -hmm. on a scale of 1 to 10. How, how successful has Free SHS been looking at the pluses and the minuses on a scale of 1 to 10? I must be frank. When it comes to its effect on quality of education, I won't give it anything more than 4. In terms of quality of yes, education? I won't give it anything more than four, probably less. If anything at all, it has lowered the standard, or the standard of education. It has increased numbers. There is no doubt about that. But increase in numbers is not increase in quality. Mm. I'm very frank about that. And that's a point people made right from the outset, that exactly. you, can, it, 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 you can increase the quantity, but, yeah. but the quality. The quality. And, and that has not been. And to me, quality is. It's very, very important. I wouldn't say quantity is not important. Of course, if you give everybody the chance to, to have a brush with some form of education higher than where they would normally have been, mm. it is a plus. I, I wouldn't say that that is wrong. Mm. But when you produce people who, after going through school for 10 years, can't even spell their own names, can't speak a, a, a sentence of English correctly. And I'm afraid it goes all the way from the lowest level, even to our universities, mm. and I will not mince any words on this, mm. even up to our universities. Mm. I wouldn't say that quality has improved. If anything at all, quality is going down, down, down. So what should we do about free SHS? Very briefly on that, so we can talk about medical education. What should we do to, to better it in, in the short term? I think, honestly, as a nation, we should think about the free SHS. It's a very good idea. In principle, it's a very good policy. Without some form of free education, I in particular, I wouldn't be sitting here. Right what was done during the First Republic. I wouldn't be sitting here. But we have to sit down as a nation, not as a political party, as a nation, and rethink how best we can run the scheme such that we can have a win-win situation. Mm. So political parties come together, uh, technocrats, people with the know-how like you come together, let's brainstorm, let's plan some trajectory for the country, educationally speaking, and stick to it, regardless of which party is in power. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. And we, we shouldn't just bury our heads into the sand like ostriches and say that because this is my flagship program, it's untouchable. Mm. Any thinking in that line is, is going to create more problems as we go on both financially and socially. Mm. We, it's about time we sat down and look at, I've been hearing comments from some reliable sources that it's being said that it's a no-go area, uh, we're not going to touch it. Others are saying, oh, it's one of the things government will uh, want to reform. It's been said recently that the 16 flagship programs from 1D1F to Planting for Food and Jobs to Free SHS to whatever, yeah. they want to look at them ag again. Uh, if, if that turns out to be true, would well, it be welcome news? It will be, but it will also be depend upon how it is ha handled. Okay. But this morning I also heard from some other station that uh, uh, it was being mentioned that uh, Free SHS is unt untouchable. But I am praying and hoping that it will be touchable. Mm. And uh, the way it will be touched will not be partisan, mm. that it will be all embracing. And people will be prepared to listen to different ideas so that we all come out with 
what will work and work well for the country, mm. not for one faction's objectives. Right. For the country as a whole, especially for the future of our youth. And I'm very concerned about that. The future of our youth is at stake at the moment, and we have to do something about it. Speaking about the youth, uh, 65 years of independence and 60 years of medical training yes. in, in Ghana. Yeah. And of course, we can talk about engineering as well. How mm. far have we come? How, how well have we fared? And, and what are the, the gray areas we ought to be looking at when it comes to medical education and even the kinds of participation? And when I say participation, I mean which entities are producing the products that are funneling into our medical schools, for example. Mm -hmm. Has it become predominantly um, uh, the reserve of some schools, for example? What are we, how well have we fared in ensuring that across the board, someone in Bungpurugu Yoyo can also benefit? Mm -hmm. What is your take on that? You, you have really brought up a very, very interesting and a very wide um, topic. Um, Professor Clifford Tego and I right. have been studying this situation. You know, he was Dean of the Medical School, Provost of the College of Health Sciences, and Vice Chancellor. Mm. I had the privilege of being a classmate of the first batch of medical students, and then I taught some medical students wow. in their first years and then I became head of the university vice chancellor. Looking at policies regarding the medical school, in fact, it was during my term of office that the school was turned into a college of health sciences. So it's an area that I've been following for a very long time. And we have studied the school of origin of medical students into our medical schools in KNUSD and University of Ghana from 1999 to 2020. Wow. We have the statistics for wow. all that. We've also done a bit of work on engineering, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. And um, we've done very, very well in terms of the numbers and quality of training that we have uh, brought about in our two uh, flagship medical schools. We've done very well when it comes to quality. When it comes to study of medicine being a, a, a vehicle for social mobility, mm. that is where I have problems right. or I have concerns. I should say I have concerns. At the last count, we are supposed to have 720 senior high schools in the country. Mm. For example, for the period 2012 or 2013 to 2020, a period of eight years, we have produced, we have uh, admitted, say, 1,272 students to, say, University of Ghana Medical School. We have admitted similar numbers to uh, KNUST, School of Medical Sciences. Of those number of students admitted, they come from just about 110 schools, which means there are 610 schools in this country which have never sent a medical student, a, a student to our medical, our two medical schools for the past eight years. Some would even say that the, the, the secondary schools are as many as 800. So when you look at it in that perspective, well, it means then, it's, then even it's even wider. Worse. It's even wider. And even when you look at the 110 or so that you're saying, yeah. I'm sure within the 110 bracket, there I'm, are fewer ones. I'm that... coming to that. Right. I'm coming to that. Let's take the University of Ghana Medical School from 2013 to 2020. The 1,272 students. The first five schools, that is Wesley Girls High School, Presec, Achimota, Mfansipim, Holy Child, and Prempe Bracket mm. in the fifth position. 
These five schools alone have produced 50% of the medical students. 50%. Wow. And 18 schools have produced more than 75% of the students in our medical school. It means the remaining 25% goes to the 80 something other schools, right. which have managed to send at least one student in the last eight years. So you would see maybe one student every three years, yeah, exactly. two students here and there. Your Very own, irrelevant number. Your own school, mm. Bishop Herman, right. which is not. Uh, which is one of the top schools in right, the country. Right. There's no doubt about it. It ranks number 34. 34, 34 on, the on the list of stu uh, schools that have supplied students to the medical school. Right. You know the number of students you have sent to the medical How school? Many? Four in the last eight years. Wow. One every two years. And yet you are 34th on the list. And, and there's 110, 110 of them. So it tells you that some schools have maybe produced just one. One for the eight years. And, and uh, throughout the period. And, and as I said, over 600 have produced none. Dr. Sena Akabua comes to mind. <laughs> <laughs> when I was leaving school, he was, he was senior prefect you know, back then. And he, and, he went to medical and, school. And if you take the top two, Wesley Girls High School, I'm not begrudging them that. It's, a, it's an excellent performance that they, they have put up. But the number of students from Wesley Girls High School is more than double the number of students from the second school, Prosec. Wow. 262 students in the last eight years, as opposed to 127 students from Presec, And then 98 from Achmota, 97 from um, uh, 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 so you Pim, right. and then 41 the tie from, between yes, Holy Child, Holy Child and, 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 Prempe. and Prempe. And you know the type of JHL students who go to these schools and their social background. Mm. That's where my worry comes from. Mm. Why these yawning disparities? Does it start from the GHS level, or is it the failure at the SHS level? No, because, because sometimes you can have a student up north in some school or some part of the country very deprived, Yet, given the right opportunities, they can rub shoulders with those from these schools. But the opportunities it, are simply not it there. It used to happen. If you look at our figures, it used to happen during the time that Legon, for example, used to admit all the students into the sciences in the first year. Right. And then they compete. Mm. And then at the end of their first year, on the basis of their performance at the, at the level 100, they are then selected into the right. medical school. The spread during that time was a little better. Was, the trends were virtually the same, but it was a little, a little better. But the factors or the reasons are many. Mm. Apart from the uh, GHS that they attend, which of course dictates the type of SHS they attend, mm. which, detects, uh, which determines whether they will get into the medical school or not. Th these are all factors that... And then the facilities in the schools that they attend. Mm. I told you uh, just uh, during the uh, early part of the interview that there are schools that have no laboratories. Now, if you have no laboratories, you can't do science. If you don't do science, you cannot get into the medical school. It's as simple as that. How, how do we fix, how do we remedy? The Let's problem? strengthen the facilities in the schools. I would we, we I seem, wouldn't we seem, we seem to be uh, content with National Science and Math Quiz, and we won, and uh, all of that. Exactly. But, but in terms of the relevance, the, the, the feel on the ground, and I'm not denigrating uh, that you know quiz and all of that. It's a wonderful thing. I mean, uh, no, bragging it, it rights and all of that. competition But the and practicality, that, how yes. do you ensure that practically it's, it's... Look at Cuba, for example. Yeah. And how they have harnessed you know, medicine... And their doctors, even in our very own country, exactly. they've been coming time, exactly. and time and again. Exactly. I, I wouldn't say that anybody who has a aggregate 12, 14 cannot cope with medical education. They can. They can. But we have had situations like 2012, when KNUST had to go as low as taking aggregate 6 with 8 A1s into the medical school. That was the lowest? That, no, that was, that was the, the, you know, 
Aggregate six means you had six A's out yes, of the eight six, subjects. Right. But even the six A's, there were too many people to uh, meet the requirements. About, they wanted about 200 people, and there were about 700 people with aggregate. Six. So they had to come down to a grade six with A in all the eight subjects. And that also gave them about almost 600 students. And so they had to then conduct an interview. And that year, Wesley Girls had 96 students with a grade eight A1s. Eight A1s, a grade six with eight A1s, followed by uh, St. Augustine's with 53 students. You know, mm. so naturally, the number of students that went to the medical school that year reflected that uh, sort of average. Right. And the schools that didn't have a grade eight, six with eight A ones, yeah, you 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 were non-competitive. Mm. You wouldn't even come on the computer. When it 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 does not mean that these people it doesn't mean cannot. that they are so, stupid. So what do we do? Do we just like with law? Do yeah. do we then broaden? Our medical system well, well, maintain the quality, hold the quality at a certain level, but broaden it so that others more can get in. Because in fact, when you look at UN standards, we, we have a deficit when it yeah. comes to yes, doctor do. to patient yes, ratio. A so, wide deficit. So it's a good idea that now we have UHAS in Ho. Mm. Uh, I'm the still University with, for Health and yes, Allied Sciences. I've been in touch with uh, Professor Japon, the Vice Chancellor. He is collating and uh, uh, compiling the list of uh, the background for the list for the background of students going into that school. We are also trying to get figures from uh, Tamale. We are trying to get figures from Cape Coast. Now there are also some two medical uh, private medical training institutions in the right. country. We 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 may need to broaden it just as we've done for law. Mm. Uh, of L course, there are, there are, there are, there is another, there is another <laughs> demon anyway. <laughs> but at least there are more people who have the chance of studying law, if even they don't have the chance to do it uh, right at the beginning of their right, university right. education. Yeah. Uh, we may have to look in that direction. But right. I think, honestly, that strengthening facilities in the schools is the most important. Mm. And that you cannot do relying on government subvention alone. Okay. We have to look at other ways and means of uh, facilitating funding going into the schools. If it will even mean declaring some of the schools as autonomous, but insisting that they have some quota system or scholarship system to be able to admit people from uh, lower income groups or from deprived areas into those schools so that they can also benefit right. from, from the good facilities in these schools. Right. I'll be all for that. Okay. Uh, now that we are talking medical ed education, uh, some of, uh, I mean, we've had the focus on STEM yeah. and now some say STEAM. Yeah. So traditionally science, technology, engineering and mathematics, yeah. and now others add the arts in yeah. there to make it STEAM rather yeah. than yeah. STEM. Yeah. Uh, the government has started some uh, initiatives when it comes to STEM education, mm -hmm. the STEM high schools mm -hmm. and all of that. What, what do you make of that? Is that one of the ways we can use to solve uh, the problem, plug the loopholes when it comes to science education? Uh, this is a typical example of how we start schemes just for the novelty of it. Just for the novelty of it. Without thinking through the implications. Mm. Here we are with a situation where almost 800 schools, as you have said, don't seem to have the wherewithal to produce the sort of quality that we want. Instead of investing in improving the quality in these schools, we are not going to start new schools from scratch mm. without making use of the schools that orig already exist. We're going to build new structures so that we can show people that when we came, we built A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four, five, six schools called STEM schools. I mean, they, there was a time when they started proper cis form science schools. 
with Presec as the first one, where even girls could come and do science in Presec. My own daughter, who is an engineer, came and did her sister's form from Wesley Girls at Presec because she wanted to take advantage of that particular scheme. Wow. Which means these things can be done within the existing schools to strengthen them. That singular action that was taken in Presec is what made Presec what it is now. So to me, building new structures is not the answer. Pouring in more money. Pouring when in when more you could have funneled that when into. You, when you can't even um, equip those new structures. Mm. You may bring in fresh new equipment, but with scientific equipment, maximum five years, they are obsolete. You have to replace. And that's where the problem begins. And apart from bringing the equipment, consumables, it is a matter of monthly. Mm. You have to be supplying consumables monthly, constantly, to maintain the same standard. And we don't do that in this country. Mm. So as for me, well, it is nice to see all these things on paper. But if how they are going to implement it, as they have said now, is the same as what it will be at the end of it, then I don't have much hope. You can call me a naysayer, but I think that if we concentrate on the schools that we have now and make them functional, make them viable, and make them produce quality, we'll be doing far, far better. I mean, we have schools that we even categorize as science-oriented schools, exactly. like my school, yes. like the Archibaters yeah. and the rest. So yeah. why not focus on them? They may be, let's say, 200 out of the exactly. 700 and something. Focus on those. Focus right? on those. Mm. Focus on those. If now we have only 100 sending uh, uh, students to the medical school, and 50 of them are producing one student mm. for the eight years mm. and you are able to raise that number to 200 schools with about 150 producing even two students every year mm. to the medical school look at the number of students or medical students that we will be able to produce in this country and the number of doctors that we can train the other angle of all of this, while we talk about the doctors and lawyers and all of that, technical and vocational training, exactly. essential to any country's yes. development. Yes. When you look at TVET, yeah. how, how have we handled the situation? What are we missing out on? Because it appears that back, what should be the backbone of our economy, industrialization, mm -hmm. is not there. Yeah. I think we made the same mistake that Britain made and is now suffering for it a mistake that Germany avoided. Mm. Technical and vocational schools are pro so supposed to produce the middle level manpower. Mm. And in any economy, the thinkers are at the top, but there are few. Those who really hold the economy are the middle level manpower. Britain made the mistake of converting all its polytechnics into technical uh, into universities. I wouldn't say technical universities, into universities. Mm. Now you go to Hartfield. Hartfield used to be one of the best poly uh, polytechnics in Britain. Now it's Hartfield University. And they are doing philosophy, they are doing sociology, etc. So Britain is suffering from a deficit of middle-level manpower. That's why they are importing a lot of middle-level uh, manpower and woman power, especially <laughs> woman power, from the Eastern European countries as well as Africa. Mm. Nurses, technicians, etc. Doctors. The Doctors. Idea, the idea. You know, Germany, of course, had these technical uh, universities, but they also have what they call the Fachhochschule. That is where they go and do the hands-on technical work. They didn't kill them. They are there. So Germany's economy is still the strongest in Europe. It's the industrial hub uh, exactly. when it comes to Europe. Exactly. Exactly. So that's where we probably have, you know, we, we seem to have neglected 
technical invocation. Uh, we, are, we, we seem to be thinking that everybody must go the grammar school line. Mm. And then we expect products of the grammar school education to now go to the technical universities. It doesn't happen that way. If we were to be able to create the situation that they are now trying to create, and they must be commended for that, where the level of technical education is raised such that you go to a technical school and you go through that line to qualify to enter a technical uh, high school you then qualify to go to a technical university so that the technical universities gain their intake from the senior technical high schools and not from the grammar school type of uh, schools. You know, it, it becomes a source for uh, personnel into the technical universities. And then some will branch into middle level technical education also. Right. You, no, it's not everybody who should aspire to university education. I'm not saying that uh, aspiring to university education is a sin or is not a good thing. But every country, provided you make sure that the people have jobs and they are well paid for. And that, that also feeds uh, into creating jobs exactly. and, and stemming the tide of exactly. unemployment. Uh, let, 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 let me quickly, uh, this just comes to mind. Agenda 111, mm. the district hospital bit. Since we've spoken about medical education, let me just weave that in. Uh, there was an interaction recently, in fact, we were trying to source information from the Ministry of Health and we were told at, at uh, you know, the multimedia group, Joy News, that uh, the ministry did not have the relevant information when it comes to Agenda 111. But prior to that, in January, we had heard from the same sector minister, Kwaji Mamenu, talking about the fact that 55 of them had started, you know, and all of that. Another project. Uh, indeed, we have hospitals that need help. We are starting 111 of them. Funding is a bit questionable right now. The economy and all of that. Are, are we getting this wrong? If you had to advise or give counsel to uh, government on this, what, what advice would it be? Well, it's, it's, it's just another example of what I alluded to uh, a few minutes ago, that we, in this country, we love starting new things, but we hate maintaining what we start and making sure that what we start works. I, will, I, I have nothing much to say about Agenda 111. I'll hope and pray that uh, if indeed it happens, are you hopeful it will happen? Well, I don't know. I don't know what government's plans are. I don't know whether there is any policy paper. I haven't seen any policy paper so that I can study it. With the setting up of uh, UHAS in Ho, I had the privilege of being given the plan, the policy document, the draft policy document, to study and send my views as an independent person and I sent a 15-page policy uh, review paper to the then government. Mm. Many of the things I suggested were put into the implementation. Now look at the way UHAS is growing because of the way it started. In 10 years, it is one of the, it's producing exactly. medical graduates. And a all lot of, that. of thinking went into that. And a lot of consultation went into that. Apart from the individuals who sent, uh, who looked at the policy document and sent in ideas. There was also a public forum held at Gimpa, where stakeholders' views were sought. So it was started on solid ground. I don't know how much thinking has gone into some of these new flagship programs. I don't know. Maybe it has happened, but I don't know. Is that part of the problem? Sometimes these things are being done and the likes of you are not, are not consulted. Uh, maybe politicians and technocrats sit down and do certain things and, and we maybe, waste taxpayers' money. Maybe it's because of my age. They think I'm, I'm, uh, I'm now senile. <laughs> <laughs> you don't sound it at all. You are sharp as a razor blade. <laughs> but, but let's talk a bit about uh, uh, the current state of things, the economy. Uh, Let me ask first, how are you feeling the economic pinch? Fuel prices are up. The last time I purchased fuel, it was almost at 11 CDs. And it's such a short time ago since I was buying at 6 CDs. Mm -hmm. 
the, the tax component on fuel products is almost three CDs, mm -hmm. around two CDs and 70 pesos. The CD is fast losing ground to foreign currencies. Uh, the dollar, it, it's, it's pegged at over eight CDs now if you want one dollar. Uh, the Great British Pound, the Euro, even the SAFA, I hear we are losing ground. And if the land borders are opened and people start trading within the sub-region, the Francophone community, is going to be bad. Mm -hmm. When you look at our economy, what do you see? And, and with the finance ministry now going to give some outlook about ways out of this, pumping $2 billion into the system to show up the CD, uh, some salary pay cuts for some members of the executive and all of that, will this be enough? What do you see in terms of the economy? How are you feeling it? And what do you think the way forward is? Well, the way I feel it personally, I don't think I'm different from any other Ghanaian. Uh, I used to fill my little car standing over there with uh, 200 cities. Mm. Just five days ago, I bought 300 cities, and it didn't even come to half tank. You used to fill your tank with 200 cities? I used to fill cities. it with 200 cities. Fill, 200. Fill, yes. Fill. Last week, you Last bought 300 week, I cities. I bought 300. My petrol light started showing. I was going for the agri freezer lecture at uh, Legon exactly a week today. Mm. And then I saw that my petrol warning light was showing. Mm. So on my way back, I branched at Goyle, right. which is one of the lowest prices. Right. Right. And I bought 300 cities. Mm. And it came to half tank. It didn't even get to half tank. 200 CDs was filling your tank. Yes. Now 300 CDs gives you half. Half. So in other words, you need about 600 CDs. That is about Roughly. an extra 200% yes. to be able to fill your tank. Yeah. That, that's, that's for fewer. Some of us thought we were alone <laughs> in this, and, in this and, business. And my pension has not changed. Uh, I had a university career. And I rose to the very highest level, vice chancellor. If I tell you what I take as pension, you, you may squirm. Nothing to write home about? Not at all. Is there something else we should look at, our pensions regime? Especially for the older generation. It's not easy. Mm. Now we are growing older than we used to. And my predecessors are even worse off. Mm. That is, you know, our pension is calculated on the salary yes. on which you retired. Right. So you can imagine what people like Kwapong and Ajay Bekuyanko were going through as far as their pension in Legon was concerned. If they hadn't, if on retirement, they hadn't gone to work in international organizations, I don't know what... Would I mean, if you as a vice chancellor at the very highest point, the very height of things, if you are saying this, then you can just imagine those who are even down uh, below. Well, you see, it wasn't until UTAC people started talking that people started asking about, uh, that these people are asking for all this, uh, how Conditions much Conditions of they, service and, and all of and, that. And they started telling people what their take home pay, pay was. Then people were saying, wow, but it's been like that for a very long time. Mm. Our university teachers in this country are not well remunerated. Their conditions of service are bad. And not, co not only that, in spite of the little that they get, I know at least for the science people, it is probably the same with the humanities people. I know for the science people that some of them dip into their pockets to support the research projects of their, their own, uh, their wow. students, because they don't want them to see them suffer. Hmm. I'm telling you this. So when people are criticizing the university teachers for what they are asking for, they should ask for the nitty gritty. They should ask for the details of what they go through. So when the university teachers went on strike recently complaining about conditions of service, that was justified? 
Me, I, I can't tell whether it was justified or not. That's a legal issue. When you put it that way, it's right. a legal issue. Mm. But what I will say is that looking at myself on pension, what I get, what my predecessors were getting, and what my successors are getting as pension, which is a percentage of what I used to get as an employee, mm. then the university teachers need to be looked at. Right. And looked at positively, notwithstanding the economic problems that we are going through. What they are asking for. As an no, what they are asking for is that they should be sent to. Uh, 2013. Uh, 2013 condition. Just right. as we are saying that we want to send our economy back to pre COVID, uh, you know, they also want to be sent back to a certain point where they feel they were at least a little better off. Mm. Because one is not supposed to lose uh, in terms of remuneration. But the value of the remuneration has been going down faster than the general average in the country. And th that is a fact. Right. So when you look at the economic conditions, as the finance minister addresses the country on the raft of measures to shore up uh, our economy, what, what are some of the things you think should be done and said to, to aid the ordinary Ghanaian, the, the commoner? Well, to me, they should look at some of the revenue guzzling unnecessary sources of uh, expenditure. Government expenditure. Public expenditure. And I'm distinguishing between government expenditure, that is what is spent on governance, and public expenditure, what is spent on the public as a whole. They should look at these two. Mm -hmm. They should set an example, however token-like it turns out to be. At least give people the confidence that something is being done. And make sure that it is not just scratching the surface, that it is meaningful. We should avoid tokenism. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Thirdly, when people talk, they should not be looked at as enemies. They should not be treated as pariahs of the, of, this, of the society. However stupid somebody's view may sound, if you listen to it carefully, because the person thought about it, you may find a modicum of wisdom which you can make use of. So we, we should be open to discussion. We should be open to criticism. Right. Um, as to what measures they will take, is the economic gurus who, who, who will be able to determine that. In, in terms of the measures, for example, and, and this is to wrap off the conversation, yeah. people have spoken about the e-levy, where your uh, mobile money transactions are going to be taxed after a certain cap, after 100 cities, 1.5%, mm. brought down from 1.75%. Mm. And some have said, no, let's go to the, uh, the IMF. There mm. they will force you to tighten your belt and do the right things. Uh, wh where do you lie on that spectrum? As well, we when, when, it, when it comes to uh, yield levy, uh, you know, uh, just as a joke, me, I don't do yield levy. <laughs> uh, you know, so you're even outside the market. Uh, I, I'm outside the market. Uh, you know, I, my son always tells people that, as for my father, he likes going to the bank and making <laughs> sure that he signs a check and collects his money mm -hmm. right there. He doesn't like this electronic thing. But for those, those down there but who will face you know, it. For those who use it, um, people have described it in all sorts of ways. Um, and they have a case. Uh, Government also has a case in saying that we need revenue. Mm. The, economies, the economics of it, um, I, I am not in a position to, to pontificate on that. I don't want to say anything that may be misconstrued as right. uh, ignorance. Right. Yeah. But, but, but in terms of going to the IMF, from your experience in Ghana's history, uh, oh, we've been that, to the IMF several times. Uh, would it force us to do the right thing uh, in terms of our economy? 
Well, I remember during my time in politics, mm. 79 to 81, especially 81, when, uh, the George Bene um, budget issue, uh, part of the package was to go to IMF. Mm. And in fact, he was in Washington negotiating with IMF when uh, the budget thing, the debate went on in Parliament right. with all its repercussions. And um, when Jerry John Rawlings took over, they jettisoned the IMF idea, saying that it was um, uh, imperialist and colonialist and new colonialist, whatever. And for two years, we, we really sank. And they were bold enough to say, look, we made a mistake. We are going to the IMF. Mm. And they did. Mm. And we all saw what happened. So there's nothing wrong now if you're in the doldrums, you can, you can get support from them? Well, we may not get the same amount of money we will get if we go borrowing from the international finance uh, market. Mm. Uh, but the advantage is that they will bring in certain measures that will force you to be disciplined mm. in your financial management. That alone may be a benefit provided the country will be prepared to swallow it. Okay. Um, you, as the then president Hilary Mann said, the IMF was saying that uh, our, at that time that our economy needed surgical treatment. And then he retorted to them that yes, we need surgical treatment, but like a good surgeon, no good surgeon will do a surgery on a patient that is anemic. Mm. So we were anemic at the time. So the IMF ought to first put in the money, or put in the blood, before the surgery is done. Mm. So that was the view that was taken. To it depends upon how you approach the IMF. Right. Yeah. Well, Prof, it's always, always, always so refreshing and uh, brain-turning, if you like, interacting with you. But uh, for those who may think that uh, you are growing scenario, it is very <laughs> far from, I mean, if ever, you are sharp as a razor, and, and I'm grateful that you've taken the time. Oh, well, I uh, said it as a joke. To join us. Yeah. Statesman, academic, former vice chancellor of the University of Ghana, Professor Ivan Adaimens, are sharing his thoughts there. Catch more uh, on our social media pages as we share stories from that. But did you know that the income of a young entrepreneur from some selected businesses is exempt from tax for five years? Any young entrepreneur engaged in manufacturing, information and communications, technology, agro-processing, energy product, uh, production, waste processing, tourism, and the creative arts horticulture and medicinal plants does not need to pay income tax on these activities for their first five years of operation. A young entrepreneur engaged in business that enjoys an initial five-year concession benefits from the following applicable tax rates for an additional five years. Pay attention. Accra and Tema, 15%. Other regional capitals outside the three northern regions, 12.5%. Outside the other regional capitals, 10%. And in the three northern regions, it stands at 5%. I'm sure you want more clarity and information on that as an entrepreneur. Just reach out to your nearest GRA office and they'll give you the details of uh, that. Thank you for staying with us this morning on the AM Show. My name is Benjamin Akakbo. Uh, let's connect same time tomorrow. Good day.